We're back on The Big Show, and one of my favourite people to watch on TV, and one of my favourite comedians is Marcus Brigstock. How are you? I'm very well. I'm flattered now. Well, I like your second name, because you sound northern, but you don't sound northern, if you know what I mean. No, Lord, no. No, no, quite the opposite. <laughs> uh, yeah, Brigstock, I suppose it has got, it's got nice sounds for, for a northern accent. But Brigstock. you're right, it would be nice, Lord Brigstock. You can yes. imagine that as well, couldn't you? Baron, I, I've always thought would be nice. <laughs> How are you? Because you're one of those kind of omnipresent TV people that seems to do that everything. No one's heard of. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, yeah. You've got your own TV show, you appear on things like Have I Got News For You, and then you're a remarkable stand-up comedian, and you do everything quietly. You're one of those workers of show business yeah. where you're never going to get the £10 million pound contract, but you're always working and you're always busy. Does that bother you, or do you quite like that? I prefer doing, well, I say I prefer, I haven't tried the £10 million contract. When I have, I'll let you know. But I like, <laughs> look, I like what I'm doing at the moment. I really do. I, You know, I have my show on BBC4 that, the, the thing I really love about it, to be honest, is they let me do what I want to do. No one interferes. You haven't got a big channel boss going, oh, you know, the ratings fluctuated or, you know, you said something that upset, whatever. They just let me say whatever I want to say. And, you know, it's... Uh, it's been fairly provocative. I'm I'm usually quite astounded that we haven't had more hate mail. I mean, I get a I get a fairly decent amount, but uh, yeah, no, it's nice doing that. And then and and also mixing it up. You know, I do loads of radio stuff and a fair bit of telly stuff, and still lots of live work. And to be honest, if I stop doing any one of those things, um, it'll be a shame for me because I I like having a finger in as many pies as possible. It's interesting. I mean, you're often found on Radio 4 and mm. BBC 4, and let's face it, these are demographically aimed at brighter people, <laughs> people who think, people who are aware of the news. That doesn't sit well with being a stand-up comedian sometimes, because you always imagine that comedians are kind of northern and down market, yet you're doing the high-brow stuff, yet you're still funny. How do you balance that? This... Um uh, it's horrible to talk about an audience as a market, but there is a market for... Um, you know, stuff that, be, that that has been thought about carefully. People do discuss the news more now, I think, than a, at any other time in my life because, firstly, the news is everywhere, you know, 24-hour rolling news and newspapers and all the rest of it. But uh, I think people are interested. You know, the shift in 97 into a Labour government that everyone held their breath for, like, oh, what's going to happen? What's going to change? And then it turned out nothing at all. You know, big business continues to have its finger in government everywhere and runs everything. And you know, we're we're at war in a in a despicable state there. And you know, we welcome various despots over here. People, I think, are really interested in this stuff. I mean, I, I know they are because I have uh, because I have an audience. Uh, that said, you know, I'm I'm also a fan of uh, of of comedy. You know, I mean, Bill Bailey is probably my favourite touring British comedian at the moment. And Bill doesn't do any of that sort of stuff. He's just plain straightforward hilarious so i mean there's there's space for all of that but that's what i enjoy my passion is is when i say politics i don't mean sort of party politics i mean like social politics uh, i'm fascinated by it's interesting because in America there's a lot of you around there, very good people who have their daily shows literally mm. and are able to vent their spleen and make jokes and make fun and in a funny way bring the news to the people who don't want to watch the news. I read an article the other day that Jay Leno, apparently his late show gives people more news than the actual news. They learn more yeah. from him than they do from the news journalists which is a fascinating yeah. reflection on society, isn't it? No, absolutely. Uh, uh, and, and the Daily Show as well. I mean, I think the Daily Show on Comedy Central was quoted as being the fourth most trusted news source in the United States, <laughs> which is phenomenal. And I mean, what it's meant is that Jon Stewart has been held up by various interviewers and pundits as, as being very responsible for, for everything that he says. And he always says, look, I, my show comes on after a puppet show. It, it, you know, it is what it is. It's a comedy show. I think that is important to remember. I, I'm, you know, I, my comedy sort of deals in pomposity and that's, that's part of, you know, the self-mocking nature of it, I hope. I hope people get that. Um, and it is just gags. It's just comedy at the end of the day. But uh, the rule for me is I don't really talk about anything comedically that I don't care about. So I don't expect people to agree, but they will get uh, a very um, unfiltered opinion from me. Unfiltered makes it sound like I don't think about it. But, you know, I don't, I don't sort of... Uh, I don't cut anything out for fear of offending anyone. It's a fine balance, isn't it, to get on the BBC Fours and Radio Fours that you can be opinionated and political but not mm. extremist. There's a fine balance, isn't there? There is, definitely. And, you know, I I have the benefit of having failed utterly to put together any sort of education. 
So I haven't come into what I'm doing from the, from the point of view of someone who was sort of actively involved with the socialist union at university or anything like that. I don't, you know, I don't know a lot about history. I can't, mo- most of the things I deal with are from the point of view of I'm astonished. Every time a, a politician is dishonest, I'm astonished. And I, I, I'm furious, whereas lots of other people uh, sort of say, well, I mean, this is what, of course, if you look back in history, this is what politicians have always done. Whereas I say, no, that can't be right. These are the people, these are the ones we chose, you know. Um, so I, I think that's probably a, a benefit that I don't bring a sort of particular form of politics to it. I mean, clearly, I've I've become more and more left leaning, if that's the case, except when it doesn't suit when, you know, I'm, I'm very uh, pro Europe, for example, which probably means that I'm rapidly right wing, you know. <laughs> I think one of my greatest thrills of the last few months was the story about David Cameron coming into work on his bike and the footage that went with it was funny. But then I found out that, in fact, his car follows him in every day with his suit and papers, which I wonder how stupid they think we are. And it just staggers me that a politician would think that I'm such a moron. I'm not going to work out that that is purely a political stunt. And it does take people like you to bring that to people like me and just make a complete mockery of them because they deserve mocking for that kind of stupidity. They do. It's it's very, very important to uh, to mock. I mean, comedy is only comedy. It's not ultimately going to change the world. But I think... Um you know, I think in in the world in the world of spin, where everything is delivered to you, you know, like David Cameron, someone rings somebody and says, uh, "David will be cycling in this morning." Uh, we just thought we'd mention it to you in case your <laughs> van full of cameras <laughs> happened to be backing out because we'd hate for him to be knocked off. Uh, you know, and a call is made and all the rest of it. And uh, you know, on a certain level, I have to say, I think it's great that he got on a bike at all regardless of the fact he was followed by a large <laughs> car full of documents. The fact that he sort of got on a bike is actually better than the the sort of stiff jaw in the back of a car saying, no, I will be carried from this place to this and all the rest of it, you know. But, uh, but yeah, you have to uh, prick the pomposity of these... Uh, of these people and uh, you know i mean particularly for me the the war in iraq was a was a particularly big thing that i i sort of really struggled with um it 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 upset me massively and and when i hear politicians talking about notions of morality and who should do what and who should behave like what and then you read that they actually voted in favor of of going into that war you sort of think ah i can't i just can't take your morality seriously which is difficult, you know. I mean, it, uh, you don't want to undermine everything that uh, that anybody that, that anybody tries to do. I mean, politicians are generally trying to do the right thing, I think. But you have to whack their legs out from under them. That's my job. Help me with why a lot of people can't do TV, radio and live. It seems like they're good at one and then they try another and fail at it miserably. How have you managed to kind of navigate the three and do each well enough to keep in work? Uh, to be honest, I don't know, except that I um, the Edinburgh Festival has played a, a big part in it I, I think in that I've always uh, I'm, I'm a huge fan of, of the Edinburgh Fringe it's an extraordinary thing to be um, part of actually there's something rather sad going on at the moment that the four biggest venues are trying to separate themselves from the rest of the Fringe and set up their own comedy festival which will make it more expensive for punters more expensive for comedians to put shows on and you know everybody else and it'll stop you know subsidies going across and all the rest of it that's all very sad but I'm a big fan of the uh, of the festival because it allows you to really explore and do different things and I've done as many different things up there as, as I can you know self-mocking shows things where I've I've sort of mocked other people impressions uh, sketches characters stand up uh, daily topical show and just tried to sort of throw the net wide I mean ultimately um, it's not rocket science I'm a bit of a tart I like performing and so like if I could sing and dance I would <laughs> <laughs> that's that I don't do currently because I know that I cannot but you know in terms of comedy I mean frankly anything where someone's willing to let me have a go I, w- I will try how do you know when you wake up in a morning one day that you're not just the average bloke in a pub with an opinion who can do it in a jovial manner? You've actually got something that people would be interested watching on the TV or listening to on the radio or watching live in a theatre. Was there somebody always telling you that, that you had an ability to perform or did you just go ahead regardless? No, I mean, you've you've very sweetly but rather inadvertently driven a spear through the very core of my <laughs> of my being. No, I mean, to, to be honest, I do. I have imposter syndrome uh, all the time, which is the belief deep down that I'm no more than a big mouth 
uh, bloke in the pub saying, everybody shut up and listen to me. I figured out what's wrong with the world. And if everyone just pays attention to me, it'll all be fine. Uh, that's how I feel. I, I am just a bloke in a pub, except that I don't drink. So my opinion's probably, probably uh, been thought through more carefully than some others. So but you're no, really just a classy Jeremy Kyle then? Is that is that the truth? That's, that, that I aspire to. If, <laughs> if only <laughs> the Kyle benchmark is, is what I aim for. No, I mean, look, I... I, I I try to point out, not so often that it becomes dull, but I try to point out, you know, that my comedy is just, it's only my opinion. You know, I do read carefully and I enjoy it when people uh, engage with me and say, oh, I think you're wrong. And I, I love that process. We can go, brilliant. Why? Because uh, then you get to show off, you know, and sometimes you win and sometimes you find out that they're actually a scientist and they know a lot more about climate change <laughs> than you thought they did. Um, as as often happens, but no, I mean I am just a just a big mouth. But that's all comedy is. It's just you know, are you the person willing in the pub to to bang on the bar until everyone else shuts up, and then just front it out while everyone stares at you? I like that feeling. <laughs> what is the feeling like? And I always ask this question. And I repeat it time and time again. When you go on stage and do your funniest joke that you think you've written, and nobody laughs, it's. There is nowhere more lonely than being in a room with between 500 and 1,000 people and your sole function is to make them laugh and they're not. There is nowhere more alone than that. Um, the middle of the desert would be a more comforting place. <laughs> it's, it's awful. because I mean, but, but the, on the other hand, you know... It, it, that's the bet that's the gamble that you make with comedy with comedy unlike any other art form for want of a better phrase you only have really one objective and if they don't laugh you didn't do your job that's it it wasn't the lighting director it wasn't the bloke who wrote the script it wasn't the casting was wrong or whatever I write it I turn up I deliver it I go home if they didn't laugh I didn't do my job there are unplayable rooms you know people are too drunk or they're there and no one's told them comedy's on or whatever or they can't <laughs> see the stage those are all factors but actually in a in a comedy environment your job is just to make them laugh and whilst it's miserable and lonely when occasionally they don't the feeling you get when you say that's where I'm going I'm going to make you people laugh and then they do and they laugh enough that they're willing to clap uh, at the end as well that's there are a few feelings bigger and better than that fatherhood maybe <laughs> really yeah although a laugh is probably better isn't yeah, it yeah probably the best thing is when the children laugh and clap <laughs> <laughs> and are they easier to please uh no 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 very discerning very difficult i've got a two-year-old and a five-year-old and uh no very difficult to make them laugh but when you get it right you know if you can get beyond poo wee fart bum <laughs> um, then you know, and and still make them laugh. Then uh, then that's that's a heroic gig, as far as I'm concerned. And in terms of being a comedian that's asked for the first time to go on, have I got news for you? Is there any greater thrill? Because that must mean you've made it. Yeah, yeah. No, that's that's the one. Actually, have I got news for you? As a as a topical co a comedian, is that's the show. But I got a free pass. You see, the first time I did it was the one that Bruce Forsyth hosted. So I didn't really have to do anything. I just walked on. I was very nervous, but I walked on, I sat down and I enjoyed the ride because that particular show, which has become quite a famous show, I think, uh, Bruce was doing what he does and Paul and Ian were astonished and that's where most of the laughs came from. So I got, I kind of got a freebie on my first go, which was, was great and I've, I've hosted it and been on it several times since. And I still think, have I got news for you, 15 years on is as good as it gets. I think that is a terrific show. And that's down to the, the, the production team, but fundamentally down to Paul and Ian. You've just got two brilliant, brilliant comedy brains at work there, going at topical comedy from two completely different angles. So whenever I'm on, I'm just I'm utterly thrilled to, to be there and terrified. It's a difficult thing to be a guest on that show, isn't it? Knowing when to come in and when to shut up. Yeah, and there are different rules depending on where you sit. Like if you're hosting... I think your job is to read the script and facilitate the jokes in the room. If you think of something that's too unbearably funny not to say, say it. Otherwise, shut up. Those are the rules. Uh, when I've seen shows where comedians are hosting and they have all of the scripted material that the host has, and then on top of that, they're out for a, you know, 
for their big gala performance, it doesn't work. It throws the balance off. If you're on Ian's team, uh, you need to do just enough to make him squirm, you know, because he's a little bit prudish. <laughs> uh, if you're on Paul's team and and you're lucky, you get that subject that comes along and you get to bat it around with Paul. You get to sort of play keepy uppies with with a joke with Paul Merton. That's one of the biggest thrills in comedy. You can do that if you're sitting on Ian's side, but it just that there are there definitely and I've sat in in all of those seats. There are definitely different dynamics depending on where you sit and who else is there as well. You know, I mean if you've got I was on with Kilroy once and the whole nature of the show shifted <laughs> into well into all of us kicking Kilroy <laughs> essentially uh but 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 for good reason. So um yeah different different rules definitely but I mean always always really really good fun. And if you know you've got Boris Johnson somewhere in the building you're probably going to win aren't you really? Well if you know you've got Boris Johnson in the building what you don't do is make a dinner reservation for afterwards because the record <laughs> I think the last recording Boris did was two and a half hours <laughs> for a 30 minute show quite impressive. Have you ever had those moments though where you've said something to generate a reaction or to make somebody laugh and you go why did I say that for Christ's sake that was the worst thing I could have said I know I'm going to get into trouble and then you do you spend the rest of your show backpedaling. Yes, yes, I have, I have. I mean, I, I try with the guests that I get on not to be just rude, because that's awful to watch. Actually, uh, you know, even if someone's fairly odious, you know, you, I think you can separate a person from their opinions for the most part. Although there are some people I would like to just have a straight up verbal fight with. But yeah, and no, I think you have to be courteous with, with guests and stuff. I think it's important you'll get better stuff from them. It's much better to encourage someone to tell you what they think than to try and always uh, convince them that your argument is is correct. It's mm. more interesting for the audience. Let them decide. I mean, they're not thick. And you very quickly run out, I guess, if you start attacking everybody who comes on your programme. Yeah, yeah. And I have said a few things that I've, you know, have made my own toes curl. I mean, I had, I had Richard Dawkins... <laughs> on the show and I was excited to meet him you know I think The God Delusion is a really fascinating book and uh, and I got flustered and I and I said some really stupid things we were yeah. talking about how wonderful science is and all I could think of to say was how much fun I'd had with Bunsen burners as a kid <laughs> you know like basically holding a jet of flame and he was just looking at me with a mixture of bafflement and pity but that's okay that's, that's the way it goes from time to time I think you're like me though you're just a troublemaker that loves a joust yeah, I, I do love a joust. I really love a joust. Why can't we fall out now? I'd love a row. I mean, yeah, go on, <laughs> go on, pick one, pick a, pick a subject. I'll take any contrary right, position you I like. I love Jeremy Clarkson. Yeah, me too. Oh, oh damn, that blast. didn't work, did it? Marcus Brigstock, thank you very much for talking to me. It's uh, a, a real pleasure. pleasure meeting you, and uh, good luck with everything. Thank Turn you. on the telly, he'll be there. Switch on your radio, he'll be there. Turn up at a theatre, he'll be there. You're everywhere, aren't you? Really? Go to the Alps. <laughs> That's the place.